Morning, everyone. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be in the Bronx. <laughs> Even though Reverend Pry is from Brooklyn. <laughs> I gave you right up. <laughs> Just, I don't want to uh, want to keep my comments relatively short because uh, Reverend Q gave us a list of about 5,000 questions. <laughs> And we need to uh, we need to get to at least a thousand of them before uh, before noon. But uh, you know what? That's just that list of questions alone means a lot. It means a lot to me that uh, the people of this city and specifically of the Bronx and Ruel, you continue to do a fine job. How long have you been up here now? Two years, eight months. Not that he's counting. That list of questions was uh, so well thought out, and uh, we've tried to give you as uh, our answers is going to be as comprehensive as possible. That's why I didn't come up here by myself. Uh, I brought uh, a number of people with me. Mike Osgood from Special Victims and Jimmy Klein from Vice. Jimmy's going to talk about human trafficking. Uh, and then everybody to uh, the left of Eddie Lott. Eddie Lott, raise your hand. Eddie's a Brooklyn guy. Everybody to Eddie's left has actually got a lot of roots in the Bronx. Everybody knows Carlos Gomez, yeah. who's the borough commander. Yeah. Terry Monahan, he's my body double, but he also has roots in the Bronx. <laughs> and then Joanne Jaffe, Chief of Community Affairs, she's got roots in the Bronx also. And then obviously uh, the big star up here, Larry McEwen, the Barber Commander Larry Clancy. And I don't have to reintroduce two years, eight months for the law students. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk about neighborhood policing for a couple minutes uh, and what we've managed to accomplish with that. Uh, talk about uh, what we identified as what we call precision policing. 2016 was an extraordinary year for the city, not just for the NYPD. We had another year we had a reduction in homicides. Um, we had a reduction in shootings. And that reduction in shootings, we had a reduction of a uh, raw number of uh, 140 shootings. That's over a 12% reduction, and I've been in this business a very long time. Uh, going to uh, Comstat, that's that weekly meeting we have down at One Police Plaza every Thursday. Uh, whenever crime is up in, in a borough, we bring people down, we bring the precinct commanders, the borough commanders down, and we have a crime strategy meeting. I've been going since 1996, and to have a reduction of uh, over 12% in shootings for one year, I think is a tremendous achievement. And again, it's not just it's not just the NYPD that does that, it's everybody in the city that does that, along with our federal partners. But if you look at the way we've changed, the way we do business over the last almost three years now, I think uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's remarkable. We saw that uh, coming out of November and December of 2014, after the Ferguson and Garnet decisions, uh, that we needed to continue to evolve. If we're gonna continue to push crime down and we're gonna make that connection to the communities, we have to change the way we do business. And I think it's, it's a testament to uh, the people sitting behind me. They've all been precinct commanders. They know what it, they know what it means to, uh, to, to run a command, to work in a precinct, to be a cop, and have connections to the community. And after November and December 2014, after the uh, brutal assassination of uh, Joe Lou and Rafael Ramos uh, that brought us into some really difficult moments in uh, the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015, we knew that we had to, uh, we had to change the way we do business, and, and we effectively have. Right now, neighborhood policing is up and running in 35 precincts. Uh, all of our, our housing PSAs, that's uh, the housing precincts that cover uh, housing developments, and so just let me give you a, a quick explanation of what that is. Prior to neighborhood policing, if you had a, if you had a precinct, then we were all precinct commanders, as I said, you had 100, 200, 300 cops. Half those cops, half those police officers would be assigned to sector cars, radio, radio cars. And they'd be answering 911 jobs all day long. And believe it or not, in, a, in a, most precincts in the city, you're in, that's what you're doing full time for, for eight hours. And especially in the busy precincts, you're doing 20 to 25 radio runs per eight hour shift. So we're in that model of policing, you have that opportunity to make a connection to anyone, except maybe the people that are calling 911. And on the other half of the precinct, you're usually involved in some sort of summary enforcement. Maybe they're doing the anti-crime work, low level drug work, um, administrative work, traffic work, 
And that's, that's not, uh, that's not a, the model of policing that's conducive to community uh, connectivity. So we made a uh, decision that we're gonna change the way we operate, change the way we do business. And first and foremost, what we did was we resected all these neighborhood precincts, neighborhood uh, uh, precinct, policing commands. Now, prior to this model of policing, the precincts were broken into sectors, and those, those sectors were, the lines were kind of uh, arbitrarily drawn. So in the neighborhood policing commands, we resected them into natural neighborhoods. So now instead of having 10, 15 sectors, they have four or five. And each one of those sectors represents a natural neighborhood. My uh, home precinct, the 4-4, four, four, is a good example of that. Uh, we had high bridge, so now that's, that's a sector. We have the same police officers assigned to the same sectors every day on the same tours. So there's the opportunity for them to, have, uh, to make that connection. And within those sectors, we have neighborhood coordination officers. And that's, that is a new uh, position that we created. And their primary responsibility is, of course, to fight crime, because that's what we get paid to do. That's why we all became cops, is to keep people safe. But it's also to make sure that they have a uh, community and the, and the sector cops have that connectivity. The big thing about this model of policing is that uh, our goal is to have each sector cop have a third of their day not answering radio runs. So they actually have the opportunity to make that connection. In my 34 years as a police officer, I started in transit, I came over to Merge in 1995. What I've heard every day is that cops have to get closer to the community. But that old model of policing, we really didn't have the opportunity to do that. But now in this new neighborhood policing model, you will have the opportunity to do that. You'll have a third of that day, you'll be off the radio, and you have the opportunity to make that connection, to go to community meetings, to, to, to visit businesses, uh, to go to schools, and, and, and to really get to know the people that you're sworn to protect and serve. You know, it's, it, there's a lot of people in each sector, obviously you're not gonna get to know everyone, but you have at least had the opportunity to, to, to make that connection, and you have some time. And to see that, uh, as Reverend Pryor said, we all want the same thing. We all want to live in peace. We all want to do well. We all want to take care of our families. That's a common bond of, of police officers and, and the people of this great city. And I think with, uh, as we move forward with neighborhood policing, I think you're really going to see a substantive change in, in, in the relationship with, between uh, this, this police department and the people of this great city. And there's a couple of ways we're going to measure that. Obviously, number one, the way we measure it is, is crime. And we have to, uh, I mean, I, I'm looking out at the audience here, and I see that there's been more than a few people that were in the city 20 to 25 years ago. And you know what it was like. We can never go back, and we will never go back to those days. So if we're going to change the way we do business, we have to make sure that first and foremost we keep people safe. And I think we're doing that. Last year we had a great year. This year we're looking to look forward to another great year, pushing crime down. But it's important that we have that connection, and uh, and, and we're getting there. It's uh, you know the big ships turn slowly. Uh, we're turning. We started this a year and a half ago, and uh, one of the another ways we're going to measure it is there'll be a uh, a real time ability uh, to uh, participate in surveys, and uh, that's that's something that should be up and running soon. Uh, come over your smartphone or maybe over your landline, you'll have the opportunity to, to make a commentary uh, by filling out a survey and, and let us know how we're doing in real time. The feedback, the anecdotal feedback we're getting from the community is very positive. Uh, the feedback we're getting from the cops is, is terrific also. It's, 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 it is about community, it is about crime, but it's also got to be about police officers. Um, most of the cops, we have 36,000 nail thanks to uh, the mayor, and uh, the city council increased our head count by about 1,300. And most of the cops came on the job, most of the police officers came on this job to do right, to do good, to make a difference, to lead a life of significance. I'm not gonna stand up here and say every one of our 36,000 police officers uh, deserve to stay in their positions. No, it's, we're like everybody else, we're a reflection of society. We're getting more and more diverse each day. But by and large, I know people took this job for the same reason I took this job. That's to keep people safe. I didn't take it for the money. I didn't take it for the benefits. There are plenty of other jobs where you could do that. They took it because they want because they're protectors. It's by it's innate in them. And I, I think that needs to be appreciated. And as we move forward with neighborhood policing, I think uh, we're going to see more and more of that. 
And part of neighborhood policing is to help identify the very small percentage of the population in the city that are involved in violence and crime. And it is a, it is a small percentage. We have to make sure, with what we're calling precision policing, that we target those people that are, are hurting other people and, and, and committing crimes. So, I guess I have, I have a couple of frustrations um, of the last few years. Uh, one of them is that uh, I think that as we move forward, I think there needs to be a recognition of all the change within the NYPD. But there also needs to be a recognition that there is a small percentage of the population that uh, do commit crimes and, and, and are, are uh, you know, they, d they don't want to conform to societal norms. You know, there's some bad people out there, and, and the police department is that vehicle that we use to make sure that those bad people are uh, brought to justice. And, and I think we did a good job of it. I think in 2016, we had over uh, 100, almost 100 takedowns, gang approved takedowns, and then we had a number in the Bronx, resulting in the arrest of uh, over 1,000 people. I think, Terry, if I'm not mistaken, most of those people are still in. And that's what we need to do. Because if, uh, who knows better than the people that live and work on a block who the people committing crimes and violence. And we're, we're pretty good at it, but we can do a whole heck of a lot better making sure we're working with the community. And I think that's how we continue to bring down violence. That's how we can continue to bring down uh, overall crime with precision policing. And I think you see that the, the reduction in the number of uh, stopping questions at its peak in 2011 was about 600,000. In 2016, we ended up with about 13,000. We have a reduction in arrest, we have a, a reduction in summonses, criminal court summonses. Uh, Vision Zero, I guess we're probably going to have a couple, couple questions about that too. Uh, we're looking for an increase in, in, uh, in summonses, just as we need that to keep people safe. But uh, you know, where we're managing all this, we're reducing the number of arrests, summonses, stop questions, and uh, stopping questions. And, and I think that's, again, a testament to, again, not just the NYPD, but everybody in this great city. Uh, I have to, before I, um, I get to the q and I do have to uh, give thanks to our, uh, our partners, our law enforcement partners, uh, the, the DAs, the five DAs offices. Uh, Darcel Clark continues to do an outstanding job in the Bronx. Uh, the four other DAs, we have uh, the Eastern District and the Southern District, the U.S. Attorney's offices that are a tremendous help to us and the uh, Special Narcotics Prosecutor, Bridget Brennan. Uh, none of this we do alone. We do, we do work with, uh, we do collaborate with uh, all these other agencies. We have a tremendous relationship with the FBI, uh, with the ATF, and uh, the DEA. Uh, they do tremendous work with our Drug Enforcement Task Force and the U.S. Marshal Service with our Regional Fugitive Task Force. So again, we cannot do this alone. It is a shared responsibility, not just amongst law enforcement, it has to be everybody in this great city making a contribution. That's how we're going to continue to do our jobs, to keep people safe, and uh, keep pushing crime down, because we do have that moral obligation to keep people safe. As I said before, and I'll say it a million times, this is why we become police officers, to keep people safe. So, Reverend Q, I guess we can start the, the Q&A. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and it's always a pleasure to be in the Bronx. Thank you very much.